Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this How to Train and Coach a Multi-Generational Sales Team webinar. Um, I'm going to kick off here in just one second. We see the number of participants climbing. It takes just a moment to bring everybody into the webinar. So give us just one second to get that. When that number stops climbing, uh, we will get started. But it's so great to have all of you here with us. We appreciate all of the interest and excitement we've been hearing from everyone um, out there. Uh, what I'd love to do, so as we're waiting to get started, we'd love to get to know everyone who is on the webinar today and get you used to using the chat function or the Q&A function, whichever you'd like to use, uh, because we will be taking your questions. We will be having some dialogue with you as we go. Please put in the chat uh, where you're coming to us from. Um, and as an extra, if you're interested, and this is only if you're interested and willing, we'd love to understand what generation uh, you happen to be. I am a proud Gen Xer, uh, so I'll, I'll get that out there right away. And if you'd like to, yep, there we go. There's some Gen Xers, um, folks from Tampa, Florida, Raleigh, North Carolina, Omaha, Nebraska, North Dakota, um, bunch of exciting, interesting places. Uh, well, we got a whole bunch coming in. So uh, appreciate that. Uh, here's what we're going to do. Let's let's get started because it looks like our number uh, is starting to, to slow down here. Uh, my name is Spence Wixom. I'm the president and CEO of the Brooks Group. Uh, super excited to be part of this webinar. I'm joined uh, with Michelle Richardson, who is our VP of Sales Performance Research. Uh, she is going to be sharing the data and the research with us, and I'm going to be playing second chair, providing my perspective as we go through. Um, if you have questions, if you have comments as we go through, we're going to be monitoring those, trying to answer those as we go or reserve some time at the end for them as well. Uh, please put them in the chat or the Q&A. We'll get to as many as we possibly can. We have some great team members helping us with that. With that, that's my introduction. I am going to turn it over to Michelle to give us a little bit of background here on this research study. And let's get going and sharing the data. Thank you so much, Spence. And it's so great to see um, all of the folks who are joining and uh, joining in the chat today. And uh, I would like to say proud Gen X here as well. So uh, happy to see everyone here. Uh, all right, so I'm having a little bit of a uh, slide difficulty. Um, let me just give you all a quick up um, introduction to the Sales Performance Research Center. Um, and uh, we are a department within the Brooks Group. And we were started several years ago uh, to really help sales organizations make strategic decisions um, backed by research insight. That is what we do. We do um, research on industry topics. Um, we have a suite of assessment tools that we can use to help our clients um, gain perspective on their team's skills, um, on their capabilities. Uh, and help them improve sales manager effectiveness, communication, sales coaching, and hiring. We work with organizations um, across multiple industries. We spend a lot of time working with clients. Um, another big thing that we do here as well is ROI measurement. So for those of you that are Brooks Group clients, um, you know that part of your engagement does include ROI measurement. So we're happy to help you understand um, you know, the, the impact of your investment with us. In terms of this research, why we wanted to engage in this research, um, you know, sales generations, um, professionals influence how individuals interact with customers, how they learn and communicate. Um, we're in a unique time right now where uh, there are four generations in the workplace. And so that really does introduce an interesting dynamic, as I'm sure um, many of the sales leaders and enablement folks on the call here today will can certainly attest to. So what we wanted to do is really dig deeper into those trends and best practices for sales leaders of multi-generational teams. This research came about as part of our sales leader trend study, um, where we surveyed uh, 155 senior sales leaders, uh, business to business sales leaders across multiple industries. Uh, 
And one of the questions that we asked was kind of the makeup, the predominant makeup generation wise of their team. And so we've been able to really analyze this data and we're excited to bring these trends to you today. Let's start with um, just taking a quick look at the US workforce by generation. Uh, as you can see here on our, on our pie chart, this is the current makeup of the US workforce. Now it is not sales specific, it's just workforce in general. And this data is from Glassdoor, it's 2024 data. And as you can see, um, baby boomers make up 14% of uh, the workforce. The silent generation makes up 4%. Gen X, 33%, uh, millennials 35%, and Gen Z, 14%. Uh, by 2025, though, baby boomers are expected to make up only 7% of the workforce. So they are going to, um, that number is going to go down by half, right? Their, their makeup of the workforce. Gen Z is going to increase to almost 20%, um, which is uh, a little more than a 40% increase there. So your teams, um, those of you joining us today, your teams may be made up of representatives from um, all of these groups. And on many teams right now, the sales leader is going to be a different generation from your sales professionals. Um, Gen X folks are moving into sales le uh, senior leadership roles. So there's an interesting dynamic that's here in the workforce, and it's going to continue to change. And we think that's going to have ramifications for how you all um, lead your teams, how you coach your teams, how they sell um, in the marketplace. Spence, thoughts on this? No, I just think I I think it's a very exciting time to have um, all of these generations working together. Uh, and one thing that we've know we've discovered, we continue to deepen our understanding of as we've been doing this research, and we're going to share with you today, is the benefits of having individuals from each of these. Uh, generations together. What we're excited to share with you are some of the strengths that we see in each generation and contributions that those generations can bring, not only as formal leaders in an organization, but also as peer coaches, as mentors, as partners working together. It is true that each of these generations brings a unique perspective. Uh, some of them resemble one another a little bit more than others, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And there's some interesting call and response from generation to next generation, so forth. Uh, but there are ways for them to collaborate effectively and lean on one another's strengths uh, to make a more effective organization. So I see the fact that we have four generations well uh, represented as a overall great benefit to us. Yeah, I I completely agree, um, and I think you know you've made that point, and we'll continue to to reiterate. There's strengths and there's weaknesses of every generation. There is not one generation that's going to be better in the workplace than others, and there really is, um, you know, a, a a great dynamic by having all of these um, these generations together in the workplace. Let's take a look at the different generations. All right. I apologize. Technical difficulties. Uh, the four generations in the workplace right now um, and the characteristics of those, uh, we have, uh, we're going to start from the top. We're going to go youngest to, um, or least tenured, let's say to, to most tenured. Uh, Generation Z, those are your digital natives. Um, they were born uh, in the range between 1997 and, and 2012. You can see kind of the, the highlights of their uh, preferences in terms of, of the workplace, um, work-life balance, flexibility, frequent feedback and growth, that collaborative work environment and that comfort with technology and remote work. Uh, for millennials, uh, you can see they are the, the purpose-driven workers, born roughly that 1981 to 96. Uh, Work-life integration and flexibility, um, frequent feedback and recognition, preferring that collaborative team environment and embracing technology and innovation. And I think there's some overlap there with Gen Z um, in terms of the, the comfort with 
um, technology. However, I think Gen Z being more the digital native, they were born with it, um, as opposed to uh, just kind of embracing it as it's come along. The Gen Xers, um, the skeptical independence born 1965 to 1980, um, we value that work-life balance and independence, that direct communication and feedback, job security and stability. Um, we value experience and skills over job titles. Um, and that baby boomer generation, the hardworking traditionalists, born in uh, 1946 to 64, uh, that strong work ethic, dedication to their jobs, job security and steady employment. They're um, they may be resistant to change, um, a new technology, and generally they may prefer face-to-face -face, um, communication. And as you know, as we've been saying, there is there's strengths and there's opportunities for development across um, of, across all of these, right, Spence? That's absolutely right. And one of the things I think we really want to point out to everybody here, as we're as we're grounding on these different generations, is, is to think about the right hand side of this slide and the left hand side of this slide as being uh, distinct from one another in a certain way. Now, it's important to recognize that these generational trends that we're identifying here are like waves that come in and out, right? They they crest, they build, they crest, they, they go out again. So just because we're putting birth years up here doesn't mean that a person right born in 1996 is significantly different than a person born in 1997. That's just kind of a a general way of positioning generational trends that tend to, like we said, rise and then kind of fall. But we do see interesting differences when you look at the clustering, when you look at the averages across these generations. But let's focus on the right-hand side of the slide as different from the left-hand side of the slide. What tends to happen with generations is the next generation tends to react to the attitudes preferences and behaviors of the previous generation. So baby boomers and Gen X tend to be different from one another. And, and I think one of the interesting ways to articulate this is to think about the movies that are very popular with each of these generations, right? So let's start with the baby boomers. What are some of the big baby boomer movies, right? There are things like The Graduate, Easy Rider, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. These are very collaborative, uh, cultural, like cohesive movies with groups of individuals working together as a team, kind of rebelling against the system together as a team. Now, what are the Gen X movies? They're things like Wall Street, Top Gun, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Those are maverick individuals, independent individuals striking out alone, like being your own person. So on the right-hand side of the slide, you have a very collaborative culture or generation. On the left-hand side of the slide, you have a very individualistic or independent generation. So the same thing plays then. The millennials sort of react against the Gen X. They are very collaborative. What are some of the movies that are big to the millennial generation? Things like The Matrix, Fast and Furious, Social Network, right? It's groups of people coming together, collaborating, like being a team, right? And then Gen Z, uh, what do we have with Gen Z? Movies like Book Smart, Edge of Seventeen, The Hate You Give. I have to be honest; I have not seen a lot of the Gen Z <laughs> movies, so I, I. But I've read the plots on Wikipedia, and again, it's more of an independent-minded, individualistic message or generation. So there's that call and that response that we have to consider um, in our multi-generational workforce. We have some groups that are very collaborative right? Um, cohesive, baby boomers, millennials. And we have some groups that are very independent, Gen X, Gen Z. And we want to kind of think about those differences. Yeah, I think um, I love those movie references. And, um, and I, again, reiterating to the group, yes, you have to kind of think about those, those differences. We also just want to emphasize that these are general trends. Um, and so, you know, as for you all as um, sales leaders, as enablement folks out there, um, you know, these are things to watch for, to kind of take into account. And obviously you want to approach each person on an individual basis, um, and, uh, but also kind of being aware uh, of those trends. Um, we have a, uh, a question from Kurt um, Spence. 
Can the generational trends also apply to marketing and how an, a, a person prefers to be marketed to? Well, I, I, that answer is absolutely yes. And I mean, you yes. can see that right in the in the movies that are created to speak to those generations, right? Going back to that one example, right? Each of them see a different message. So with boomers and millennials, it's being a part of something, um, right? You, it's more associative. And then with Gen Z and Gen X, it's more independent, right? So think about then the messages that we're presenting as sales leaders in coaching and developing our people, right? Speaking to baby boomers and millennials, you can be a part of something. This will help you be a part, contribute to support the organization. Gen Z and Gen X, this will help you build your personal brand. This will help you stand out as an individual. Now, a lot of the development we provide, a lot of the support we provide as leaders can do both of those things depending on the perspective or the interest uh, of what it, the individual might be using that development for. So it's very important for us as leaders to think about what is the message that we're sharing and to which individuals are we sharing that message. We can present the same idea, the same concept um, to baby boomers, millennials, or Gen Z and Gen X, but if we position it differently, we get the better chance of it engaging them. Yes, absolutely. Great, uh, great point. Um, all right, let's now dig into the different generations and various sales skills. So first thing um, our study looked at was how each generation prospects. Um, so boomers tend to use events and trade shows. Gen Xers um, tend to use inbound leads. Millennials tend to use promotional offers and discounts. And Gen Zers use cold outreach and promotional offers and discounts. So they're more likely to use these, um, these trends. So what I think is really interesting, and Spence, you and I have had these conversations um, kind of about these different uh, these different strategies, is it's kind of reflective uh, of the generations, right? You know, the boomers are using the the more face to face type communication. Um, you know, Gen Zers are uh, came of kind of came into their careers during the. Uh, the inbound lead revolution 10 to 15 years ago, um, millennials uh, are, and Gen Zers, but in particular millennials kind of coming into the workforce at a time when the economy was great. And so they weren't really having to uh, work, I guess, as hard to generate those leads. Um, and the, then Gen Zers are probably more likely at this stage in their careers of being in those entry level kind of the the BDR type roles where cold calling is part of their um, uh, you know of their roles. So I'm you know I'd love to get your your feedback and your thoughts on these as well. Yeah, I mean, look, I'll, I'll, this is exactly the point we were making earlier, where there's something we can learn from each of these groups. There's a way they can support one another, peer coach one another and and develop one another. So let's start with um, looking at the boomers. You know, I was at an event, I was at a trade show just last week and I looked around at the audience of that trade show, who was there and it was mostly boomers and Gen X. But what were those people comfortable, capable of doing? Going up, meeting people face by face, face to face, networking with them, developing relationships, uh, building that um kind of that deep understanding and personal relationship with each other that is so essential to doing business. Your boomers, and to some degree, your Gen Xers, they have that experience. They know how to do that. They know how to build those relationships. They can teach the other generations who have been more of a volume scalable digital world in their prospecting. They can teach them how to do that. At the same time, the millennials and the Gen Zs can teach the boomers and the Gen Xers how to do that scaled outreach, how to use technology tools to really extend your reach and get more efficiency in, in what you're doing. So there's the, the big question I think for millennials and Gen Z is how can I really meet and engage with people and build deeper relationships with them? For boomers and Gen X, how can I scale and get more efficient 
in what I'm doing. I mean, it's interesting. I think the Gen Xers are really comfortable with the inbound leads because they came about at the time when inbound marketing was new and fresh and really work. So they need to realize, oh, hey, there are some additional elements I may need to add on top of that strategy to be much more efficient. Um, I think the millennials and the Gen Z, they like the promotional offers and the discounts because they're in the first difficult selling environment of their career, right? 2012 to 2019, there was more money flowing into the economy than there had been in 4,000 years. There was a lot of business being done almost in spite of salespeople. Well, that has all changed. And I think we have to make sure millennials and Gen Zs aren't just reacting to, well, what do we got to do to drum up business? We got to give more promotions, more discounts. No, we just need to develop that experience and that capability to sell, which the boomers and the Gen X can help them develop if they watch closely and are mentored by those other generations. Great perspective. Um, you know, the other thing I think is really interesting as part of our study, we, um, in the survey, we gave these options as, um, you know, how is your team most likely to prospect? And the one that really did not, uh, that nobody's using predominantly is referrals and targeted outreach, right? So outreach to your um, your ideal client profile, really honing in on, on those ideal clients. So I think there's also an, there's an opportunity across the board to, um, to upskill your teams and, and introduce this, uh, this other way of prospecting as well, which, you know, referrals we know is a, one of the most effective ways to generate new leads. So, you know, you're, there's an opportunity there to improve the effectiveness of prospecting across the board. Yeah. And, and think about this, Michelle, that's a really good point. And okay. So that's the direction we all want to go, right? Because we know also in our research that that's the most effective channel for high yield, opportunities is referrals, selling to people who already have experience with you, who have somebody telling, you know, an outside expert telling how good you are, like referring right. you in, right? All of that, that network selling is, is so important. Well, each generation brings a valuable component to lead to that outcome, right? The boomers, the Gen X, they know how to develop the relationships to get there the Gen Zs and the millennials know how to use the tools and the efficiency to get there. So we can get to like good referral networks at scale by utilizing the strengths of our younger generations, as well as the strengths of our more mature generations. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Let's take a look at sales process and how um, our generations approach sales process. So um, our research indicates that Gen Z teams are less likely to follow a sales process. 58% of teams with mostly Gen, uh, Gen Z sellers consistently follow a sales process, whereas 75 to 94% of um, other teams, so teams made up of um, boomers, Gen X, or millennials. And why is that important? Well, if you've attended any of our other uh, webinars or you have um, read our research study, our sales leader trend study that we put out um, in um, earlier this year in January, then you will know that our study found that successful teams, so those teams that meet or um, that met or exceeded their revenue goal in the previous year, 95% of them followed um, a consistent sales process. They adhered to that sales process. 69% um, of underperforming teams adhered to their um, sales process consistently. So it matters in terms of revenue attainment, in terms of goal attainment. And so there's an opportunity here if you have a team of mostly Gen Z sellers. Now, younger sales professionals, these are folks that are newer to, um, to selling, newer to the workforce. So they might not be familiar with the benefits of following a sales process, or they may not have been part of an organization where process adherence has been expected or reinforced. So they may not have had the training um, or the experience. And so there's an opportunity there for those of you who have um, a team of Gen Z sellers or a Gen Z um, you know, component to the makeup of your teams. So here's the interesting thing, Michelle. I, first of all, I think this does indicate it forecasts a problem for the future. And it's a problem we all need to be aware of, right? 
we have Gen Z is a very independent minded, individualistic generation. They want to do things their own way for their own benefit. So we ha we have to take that into account. We have to work against that because process adherence is critically important for an organization to scale and for a sales team to be successful. But there's an interesting key in here that I think can be supportive of an organization in helping Gen Z understand the importance of and benefits of process adherence. When you look at that 75% to 94%, the 94% adherence are Gen X. Okay, if you remember the previous slide that we talked about, right? Gen X, Gen Z, they're on that individualistic side of the spectrum, right? So why is Gen X so keen on sales process adherence? Well, I think number one, they've had a lot more reps at doing it. They, they're a little more mature. They recognize the importance of process adherence, but they also recognize that that is their path to success. They've learned that there are principles of selling. There are activities that work not only to the organization's benefit, but to my personal benefit to help me be as successful as possible. So I think sharing with the Gen Z that sort of individualistic message, right? That Gen X individuals in the organization, they use this process, and these activities and this structure to help them individually be successful. I think that's a message that better resonate, re, um, that, uh, what am I trying to say? That connects with them in a better way, right? They want to, um, when they can see what's in it for them, how it helps them build their personal brand and their own personal success, uh, I think that's the right way to go. Yeah, yeah. It's and it's it's that um, classic, I think, motivation strategy that we talk about, um, that we have talked about consistently in in other webinars, um, and that is like tapping into those motivators, tapping into what drives the individual in order to you know put the reward out there rather than um, you know it's the carrot versus the stick. So tying it to what's most important to them. Absolutely. Yeah, and so let's now look at questioning and objections. So 76% um, of Gen Z teams and 53% of millennial teams struggle with managing objections and negotiating terms. 61% um, of millennial teams and 57% of Gen Z teams struggle with discovery and questioning. Now, I think, you know, especially in questioning, I think all the teams um, and generationally struggle with questioning to to a certain extent. It is higher um, with this, with millennials and Gen Z and the same with managing objections. Um, and you know you um, alluded to this earlier, Spence, that um, during most of the selling career of some of these younger generations, there was a great deal of business that was, that was driven by easy money. So now that environment is has changed. Um, questioning skills, that deep discovery that's needed to really fit a solution with strategic priorities, that's needed, right? So the um, the boom times, I think, kind of mean that some of the skills either weren't developed or maybe atrophied a little bit. Um, and we're also seeing the rise of, you know, committees, um, maybe more uncertain economic conditions. And so that's slowing the buying process. And we're having to work a little bit harder um, in those earlier stages. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Just to start with that second point there around discovery and questioning, right? We we had an environment for about 10 years here earlier where we didn't have to go deep to understand the aims and the motivations of our customers in, a, in order to position a solution that they would be comfortable, excited about buying as a complex buying group, right? There was a lot of business that was just getting done because the money was there and the growth was there and it was happening. We're in a different environment now. We have to understand how to do all generations that discovery and that questioning. Again, I think the younger generations can learn from the more mature generations in how to do that kind of activity. Um, as far as managing objections and negotiating terms, I think that's a that's a combination of two things. Number one, they're just experienced doing it, right? You've had the reps, You've learned, you've seen these different objections. You've learned over time how to handle them appropriately. There's just an element of maturity there. Again, peer coaching, development around um, that particular piece. But then I think there's also the element, and we talked about this earlier, right? What do, um, there's a there's a hint in the fact that the, um, 
the baby boomers, they like those events and that networking because they're good at developing deep relationships. When you develop deep relationships up front, it helps you in managing the objections and negotiating the terms on the back end. But if we're just focused on volume prospecting and volume activity on the front end, we're going to find that it's more difficult for us to manage those elements on the back end of the process. So this is where, again, the boomers and the X can be helpful to these younger generations. And here's how you really develop stronger personal relationships up front that will benefit you on the back end of that sales cycle. Absolutely. And I, I like that you connected back to, you know, being effective in your prospecting and building that rapport in those relationships, that it's a, it's really a, um, a sequence and there's links and it's connected. So the better you do on the front end, the better you're going to do, uh, your teams are going to do, you know, as you progress through the sales process. I did want to add one more thing as well. And there's data in the the white paper in our in our um, study on this on multi generational teams. But where, um, in terms of like the level of questioning that most of these teams are really kind of um, staying at is that product based questions. So they're only asking enough questions to really be able to spec a solution without really getting deep enough to understand what the buying process is and really understanding those emotional drivers and the, the wants that kind of go um, underneath the needs. And that will also then contribute to struggle with managing objections and negotiating terms. If you're only getting surface level information, um, you're not getting deep enough to really be able to, uh, to build value. And speaking... Yeah. That's a oh, great point. And, and I, I want to react to that point really quickly, but I also do want to, let me just take a quick break and respond to Christopher's comment here, which is such a good one. We know leading people yeah. is very individualistic. When we are managing expectations, should our expectations change with each generation? I, I don't think our expectations as far as where we want to take individuals should change as much, more an appreciation of where they are and their starting point and the strength that they have and the benefit that they bring to the table and the direction by which they will be sort of walking toward uh, that greater performance. And again, that goes back to like, um, where are the strengths in the older generations, likely in developing those deeper relationships and managing the back end of the sales cycle? Where are the strengths in the younger generations in volume of prospecting and efficiency of activity and creativity and innovation using technology? So that's where they are. We want to all we want to bring them as much as possible to a more cohesive, well-balanced skill set, capability set. So again, to me, I think the most important place to start is um, just appreciating where people are and and finding a vector or a direction for them to develop. Great answer. Great answer. A couple other questions that have come through. Um, there was one question on where we got this data from. So let me level set there. Um, and we talked a little uh, about this a little bit right at the very, very beginning. This is part of a study that um, our, the Brooks Group uh, and our Sales Performance Research Center conducted um, with sales leaders. So um, this is um, the result of data from 155 senior sales leaders in business to business across multiple industries. And it is segmented by the uh, the generation of their the predominant generation of their team. So that's where the data uh, came from. And uh, we got a couple more questions. Um, we keep mentioning maturity level as if maturity naturally comes with age. It doesn't. How do we develop the maturity of a sales team purposefully and mindfully? How are we investing in intrapersonal skills and adaptability and resilience? instead of just hoping it comes with age. And that is from Alexandra. Um, Spence, thoughts on that? I know I have a couple as well, but love to no, hear your perspective. I, I, that's a really good point that Alexandra made, right? Is in maturity comes from experience and sort of your um, your depth of learning and your your speed of learning and adoption, right? There, you're absolutely right. If you're if you're not doing correct behaviors for a 30 year career, you're in no better place 30 years later than you were at the beginning. So it's it's um, strengthening those behaviors and it, over time. And some people can um, develop maturity and capability 
faster than others. I mean, a lot of what we're doing here is looking at kind of general averages and, and expectations, but um, so you cannot take this as a, a kind of first pass in evaluating an individual, what this can, what this data can do in this perspective. So it can help you deeper understand perhaps some of the things that you are seeing across your team with individuals and such, but it, I, I don't think it replaces the the need to really assess individuals and focus on understanding individuals. As we said before, right, even though people may be positioned in a particular generation, doesn't mean that they aren't, like they don't have elements from another uh, generation present in them. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I like that you mentioned kind of taking that individual approach. Um, I think a lot of these skills can be coached and and managed. There is absolutely um, maturity that comes with experience, but we can also um, assess and coach to things like resiliency and um, decision-making skills and problem-solving skills and the ability to uh, your interpersonal skills and, and your ability to influence others. So, um, you know, there are tools out there. I think it's also uh, for organizations, for sales leaders, um, for L and D folks, the the idea of, of maybe needing to coach and develop and train to some of these skills as well. And now let's um, take a look at selling on uh, or connecting value to ROI. So this was another data point. Um, and the idea is that you know what we found most teams are not connecting value to ROI as as kind of that that highest level approach of being able to sell value, right? So the ability to um, just simply connect, uh, present your price, and and hope it lands well. Um, there's the strategy of just um, kind of putting all of the features of your product or service out to a customer and and hope that um, something sticks. Um, there is the option of actually uh, connecting the value of your solution to the needs and wants of, of the customer. Um, and there then is that next level of really being able to connect the value of what it is that you sell, those uh, what it is they need, they want to a return on investment or some kind of ROI to the customer. And most teams are not doing that. Um, Gen Z sellers use that connect value to ROI approach more than the other sellers um, or sellers from other generations. It's not a huge difference, though, between Gen Z and millennial teams. 25% of Gen Z teams, 23% of millennial teams, 3% of, of Gen X teams, and it was actually 0% of, of boomer teams. So a value selling approach really is, is critical, that ability to add value to your product or service. And so when you're only selling on price, obviously your margins are slim. Um, you know, the profitability and the long-term growth um, are more of a challenge for you if there's little value to really differentiate you from your competitors. So there's, this is an opportunity across all generations really to improve the skill set. Yeah, this it goes back to kind of what <laughs> Kurt called out there. Yes, this is alarming because this is one of the most difficult things salespeople have to do. And it it manifests itself, particularly in a more challenging sales environments. In a booming economy, you don't necessarily, and people have a natural desire to buy and invest in things and deals are just getting done. Um, you just basically have to have the thing that's there for sale for people to buy it. But in a more difficult environment where you have to convince, there's much more resistance, there's much more indecision, and you have to convince those buying groups to take action, you need to align what the value of what you have to sell with the aim or the goal or the business improvement opportunity of the customer. So there's a lot of critical thinking and depth of positioning um, and presentation that needs to happen more across the board in sales organizations. That's one of the things that we're seeing. But what's interesting about this is ROI is not just economic ROI. Um, it it is you know uh, a, any kind of return that you get on the investment. It could be improving your culture. It could be mitigating risk. It could be strengthening uh, the organization in some way. So. What's interesting is, you know, millennials and Gen Zs understand that purpose-driven approach, I think, more than some of these other generations. And so I think they're connecting with this idea of presenting ROI 
um, more naturally. So I think other generations can learn from them and um, strengthen their ability to do it. But it's a direction everybody needs to head. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, so what does this all mean for sales leaders? If you are managing um, a, a multi-generational team or a team that's you know maybe um, uh, made up of more one generation than the other, so let's just kind of break it down here by generation. So your Gen Z um, trends in terms of, of managing and coaching um, these uh, this generation provide frequent feedback and opportunities for growth, leverage technology and those digital communication channels, allow flexibility and work-life balance. We know that is something that's important to this generation. Emphasize company values and social impact. So Gen Z um, is really interested in and values that social impact. So emphasize that um, in, you know, in your management and coaching, in your retention, even up, um, uh, strategies for retaining your, your high performing Gen Z. Potential skill gaps and, and training opportunities. We talked about sales process, right? Um, that There's an opportunity for training and a, a gap that you can address there. Prospecting, um, maybe developing more prospecting skills around um, person to person or face to face prospecting. Um, things more around uh, generating referrals and really honing in their their willingness to use digital tools into targeting more of an ideal prospect, um, and then of course managing objections and negotiating terms um, topics that uh, we were just talking about. Um, Spence, any additional insights there? The one the one thing that I would add here that's particularly important is, um, and this has been called out to me by experts in this uh, field is. Making sure wellness is a big part of the strategy uh, with Gen Z, that you're offering those resources. They tend to take advantage of them and need those uh, resources, given some of the difficulties that this generation has come through in in recent years. So, um, you know, they'll take advantage of of uh, wellness resources, including mental health resources, when provided to them. They've got a big learning curve and a difficult path to uh, to develop going forward, and that can be very beneficial to them. Yeah, good point. Um, I'll go back to a question that um, Kurt sent in a little bit earlier, since we're talking about Gen Z. Um, with Gen Z not being in the sales process, how do they feel about CRM and logging in, in data into these systems? Um, I don't have specific data on that um, in particular. I would encourage um, Kurt, a, using a tool more around, say, DISC, understanding kind of behavior styles and their overall sense of detail orientation and willingness um, and, and propensity towards the uh, more administrative work. Um, not That's just not something that this that our study um, addressed. Spence, I don't know if you have any thoughts just based on your own research there as well. No, I mean, look, my my thoughts would probably agree with you on that. <laughs> Something <laughs> definitely we want to look more into, though. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, so Gen Z, we've covered that. How about millennials? Let's take a look at those recommendations for millennial teams. Um, so the trends for millennials offer coaching, mentorship, clear career paths, um, creating that collaborative and inclusive team environment. We've talked about this being a more collaborative generation. Um, allow more for that work-life integration and, and remote work options, providing opportunities for learning and development, um, you know, giving them the opportunity to improve their skills. Uh, the potential skill gaps there, um, discovery and questioning, right? We, we just looked at that um, a few minutes ago. Uh, and I would say digging deeper there, getting above that um, product focused line of questioning um, and getting more into deeper questioning, understanding the, the buying process, um, understanding um, kind of the needs and wants of, of the decision makers. And we talked about prospecting, uh, managing objections, negotiating terms, all areas um, for potential um, training and development for for millennials. Spence, anything to add there? No, I mean, I would just reinforce the back end capability, the managing objections and negotiating terms for the millennials. They're going to be developing into uh, sales leadership roles. Um, the prospecting is 
again, depth of prospecting and relationships? And can we learn something from uh, other generations who have um, used other methods of prospecting that maybe this particular generation isn't used to? Excellent. All right. And how about those uh, Gen Xers, recommendations for our Gen X teams? Um, offering work autonomy and a results-oriented approach. So um, we talked about this being a more individualistic um, or independent um, generation in terms of work style, providing work-life balance and, and flexible schedules, leveraging in their experience and their input, um, communicating directly and avoiding excessive corporate jargon. So potential skill gaps and training opportunities here. If your team has a, um, a significant Gen X presence, um, discovery and questioning. Again, you know, we talked about that being um, really a consistent area of development across all the teams. Same with connecting value to ROI, um, managing objections and, and negotiating terms. So again, I wanna just emphasize going beyond those product-based questionings, getting that higher level of, of questioning skills in with, with your Gen X teams. Yeah, and Spend again, time. I think the connecting yeah. value to ROI is just an important piece there um, for, for the Gen X, um, can learn something from other generations who are trying to do that in a, in a very innovative way. Yeah, absolutely. And our boomers. So recommendations for our uh, boomer teams recognize their experience, their loyalty, and strong work ethic, uh, maintaining respect for hierarchy, more traditional processes, providing stable working conditions, job security, and offering training on new technologies adopted by the company, uh, potential skill gaps and training opportunities for your, um, for your boomer teams, prospecting, um, and again, I think the emphasis there on, on using more scalable digital tools for prospecting. Um, and there's an opportunity there probably for some cross-mentoring peer coaching between generations on how to, um, how to use some of those tools. Questioning skills and then connecting value to, um, to ROI. Um, the, there's a, a huge opportunity there in terms of, of developing that, that value connection. Um, boomers may be in a position where they have strong, the, the relationships, the longstanding relationships, um, longer presence in their territory. Maybe they've not had to get to the point of having to communicate ROI. However, this is a, you know, a skill that will become increasingly important um, in, in today's selling environment. Spence, thoughts on that? Yes, my, my thoughts with the boomers is leverage that um, learning around the way they develop relationships and um, build an understanding uh, and trust in the people that they work with. I've seen a lot of that recently. It's a really good example uh, to follow. Again, everybody's got to get deeper on the questioning to understand the aims of the business and then connecting that to ROI. Boomers, like everybody else, needs to develop in that area. And I think with prospecting, how do they prospect more for scale? But boy, there's a lot we can learn uh, from individuals in this generation of um, how to do things at a depth that perhaps are not being done as much anymore. Yeah, and that's absolutely. important in complex selling. Yep, art we yes. cannot lose. Yes, great, great point, great point. All right, so empowering the multi generational team. So let's uh, let's say, um, as probably most organizations, your teams are are a mix of different generations. So how do we um, how do we address that? How do we empower a multi generational team? So motivate, recognize, and reward each generation. And we've we've talked about that throughout. Um, and and that is just tapping into the trends, using these trends that we're presenting. To, um, to identify potential strengths and, and weaknesses um, in general across your team, um, but motivate, reward, and recognize them according to their personal motivations, um, according to you know, what drives those, rather than painting everybody with um, a single kind of wide um, brush. Use assessment tools to identify coaching and development areas. Um, assessment tools can really help you pinpoint where the gaps are 
and what those capabilities um, and uh, the strengths and, and opportunities and what your entire team brings to the table. So that's really going to help you personalize um, your approach, whether you're training, whether you're coaching, whether you're managing your teams. Provide targeted sales training. So once you understand where those gaps are, address it, whether that's sales process training, whether it's just a uh, more of a, a skill-based intervention, um, being able to understand the makeup of your team, um, what drives them, what motivates them, where your skill gaps are, understanding that from an objective standpoint, then you're able to then address, um, address those gaps through training. Um, adopt change management best practices. So any investment that you make uh, needs to be followed up with some type of change management or reinforcement so that that change will stick. Uh, we actually did a webinar on change management a couple of months ago. So if you're interested in taking a deep dive into that topic, um, check that out. Um, and then finally, implement a sales process to establish consistency. So we've talked about uh, the importance of sales process, um, how it um, can influence and really support revenue attainment. Um, so we see that as a real critical element. Spence, anything to add on on this uh, on this topic? Look, I, I think just to reiterate some of the key points here, right? Process to establish consistency. It's a really important thing as these generations are evolving and changing that we need to to stay focused on. And again, it's We've identified some trends here in this initial research. I think deeper, more research needs to happen. Uh, I, we're kind of connecting our ideas and thoughts to other research that people are doing, but it doesn't provide enough clarity to make an, an assumption about an individual here, right? What I think is important, and that's the second bullet point, is to really assess and understand each individual in your organization and use this data, use these resources as a way to to sort of deepen your understanding of that individual. This can give some justification or some understanding as to why you may be seeing certain things in certain individuals. But, and yes, there are probably ways in which you can target that training around particular areas to generations and get, make more benefit than, you know, just focusing on training and coaching and reinforcing everything to every individual. Um, but it really is important to, to go deep enough to really understand each of the individuals in your team and then think critically about how them being a part of a particular generation motivates them to behave or communicate or prioritize things in a certain way. Yes. Yes. Excellent. Absolutely. All right. I want to invite you all to, um, to submit questions. We have a few here we're going to, we're going to take, um, but Feel free, first of all, to, you'll see the QR code there. Um, if you'd like to download our, um, our sales leader trend report, managing a multi-generational sales team, there's the QR code. You can um, access it right now. We'll also be providing a link for, um, for this study uh, with the recording. And, you know, um, Spence, you also, you touched on the assessment piece um, just a second ago, and we've got a couple of questions related to that. Um, so can assessments be used to help advance people with generational skills? Absolutely, yes. Um, you know, what we're providing is kind of the, the high level generational trends um, and an assessment can really help you narrow that down into to the individual. It can also help from a self-awareness tool uh, in understanding how to adapt to to other styles. Again, more on that that individual level. So thank you, Kurt, for submitting that question. Um, and then we also have uh, along the same lines, would a disk assessment or Myers Brig Myers Briggs be ideal to have anyone onboarding on our sales team so we understand the employee's personality? Um, and again, Absolutely, I would absolutely uh, recommend um, an assessment. Our, as an organization, our preference, um, we would certainly advocate for the use of, of a DISC, as well as even um, an assessment that uh, would assess the motivational drive. So you understand why somebody wants to, will take action. Uh, that really can be helpful in not only um, communication, but in coaching, managing, motivating. 
And uh, the name of that assessment, if you are interested in learning more, um, that is our Brooks Talent Index um, assessment. And we can certainly provide more information on that, um, on that follow-up follow question on the name of that assessment. And Spence, let's see, we had um, a couple of other questions. So uh, someone wondering how many individuals were part of the study within each generation? So we do not have that particular number. So our study um, surveyed sales leaders. And so the questions that we were asking were about their team. So their data um, about their, in, their teams. So we surveyed 155 senior sales leaders, um, all with, in organizations of uh, $50 million in revenue or greater. So uh, you can kind of e extrapolate the, the size of the teams from there. And so we had a range um, ac across enterprise levels there. Yeah, and what's exciting about this study is it's starting to give us a perspective of these different generations, particularly among salespeople. What I think, and this is to answer another question there around uh, the boomers, they are a smaller portion of the population. So it's a little difficult to glean as much data around that particular generation as it is the other more prevalent generations right now. But I think what this motivates is a look particularly at that generation to understand as that generation will be kind of moving out of the workforce in the next few years, how to best take advantage of having those individuals on your team. So what this is motivated is for a way for us to look more deeply at that and answer some of the more nuanced questions around boomers. We were able to get some data there, but definitely not as much as we would like. Yeah. Um, all right. Another question. So we know output selling is most important, and we know um, a lot of successful individuals follow some sort of process. At what point does following a rough process become as important as the output? So uh, I guess is the question, at what point is following the process as important as making the sale? is the way I'm interpreting um, that question. Yes, um, thoughts on that, Spence? Yeah, my, look, my thoughts on that are a, a, a process provides good structure by which you can then innovate, right? And, and improvise on top of that process. They always say of jazz music, right? You need to know the rules so that you can break them. And I think that's the important thing that we're trying to set into an organization is you know what, is what are good things to do at each stage of a sales process, then individuals can apply situational judgment to that process. If you don't, and this is where these younger generations feel a little bit lost right now. If you don't have good process established in your organization, if you just bring people in and say, go for it, go try to figure out how to make it work, you're going to get a lot of people skinning their knees and stumbling and taking a long time to develop. But if you set up and say, this is the structure by which, you know, the general selling structure or process that we have, um, then they have something by which they can apply situational judgment to, and it accelerates their development and their, uh, their competency and their ability to perform. So that's, a, it's, it is always a judgment call, but you cannot make those judgments unless you have a process to make those judgments against. Absolutely. Thank you so much. All right. Um, if there are any more questions, um, I don't see any more questions. I, again, I want to encourage everyone to download our sales leader trend report on managing a multi-generational sales team. Please feel free to check out our website as well, because we do have other studies, um, including our original sales leader uh, trend study from earlier this year. And uh, we talked a lot about prospecting. We have a white paper on what works in prospecting as well. Uh, we want to thank all of you for joining us today, Spence. Thank you so much for joining me. This has been uh, a great time. I, of course, love reviewing this, this data with everyone. It's a great topic. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you for your questions. Um, stay engaged with us on this. We'll be putting more out there. We would love to have more conversation with you. So appreciate everyone uh, taking your time to join us and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you so much.